Thank you for joining okay. us. Okay, it's exactly seven o'clock and we are going to get started. Okay. Um, so um, everyone is going to be, we're going to see all of you and you all look beautiful tonight and please, um, everyone's on mute. Hey, Jennifer. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you tonight. Oh, My name is Miranda White. I am the president of the DC Federation of Democratic Women. And I have the pleasure of bringing you all together tonight for our Let's Get in Good Trouble. As many <laughs> of you know, this year has been a year we really want to forget. 2020 is one we'd like to erase from the books forever. However, mm. we've had to live through it. We've had to live through 45. We've had to live through, uh, what's his name, DeJoy, with um, intentional and unintentional voter suppression. And so we are all fired up and ready to go in terms of making certain that in this upcoming election on November, uh-oh, what happened? Oh, on November 3rd, that we are victorious. Many of you did not know, and I had the unfortunate pleasure of watching President Trump on the evening of his final speech. And the last song that was sung, I speak Italian, the last song that he sang, which many people didn't know, was an opera from La Traviata, and the song was called Nessun Dorma. And the opera singer basically sang in Italian, when, it, when the dawn comes, I will win, I will win, I will be victorious. Oh. The average person who was listening to that did not know that that is what he was telling the world. He is mm. seeing the world in another language I'm a winner, I'm going to win. I know it's going to hit you, but it's going to happen. So with that said, our purpose here tonight is, okay, please mute your phones, everybody. Um, our purpose here tonight is we want to get in good trouble. We want to do whatever we have to do to make certain that we get out the vote in this election cycle and that we win. We want to support um, uh, Vice President Biden and Kamala Harris. And we want to make certain that we as women, women in general from all over the country, that we are out here making a difference, bringing our family, our friends, our communities, everyone together to make certain we can out, whether it's by absentee ballot or if we go to the polls or if we've used a drop box. Either way, we're going to make certain that we make it to the finish line and that we win. So with that said, I'd like to ask Ms. Prudence Johnson. She's from the Maryland uh, United um, uh, Democratic Women of Maryland. I'd like to have her give an opening prayer, non-denominational prayer, and a moment of silence for Chadwick Boseman. Prudence? Yes. If we might all bow our heads. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you so very much for all you continue to do. Despite the things that we see, we know you are still in control. We know you are Lord of all and that you see and know all things. We pray that you would encourage the people in this country, in this nation, in the world, that you restore hope to those who have lost it. And we ask that you would give us victory, that you would bring forth total victory, that your will would be done, and God, that you would remove this tyrant from our White House. Put people mm -hmm. in government who have a heart for, for people, a heart for community, the beloved community. We praise you. We thank you so very much and ask that you would bind all of our hearts together, that we will work together to do those things which are pleasing in your sight. Unify us as women who are on the move to do some amazing things for you and in this world. We thank you and it's in your precious name we do pray. At this time, we want to take a moment of silence and ask that Everyone, just take a moment of silence in honor of Chadwick Boseman, our uh, beloved, I say, king of the Black Panther. <sighs> thank you. And thank you, Prudence, for those words of... of, of, of Let's put it this way, guidance and inspiration. And once again, we do feel the loss of the um, wonderful man who signified for us, many of us, justice and equality. And he just was a wonderful spirit. Um, with that said, I'd like to ask, um, introduce uh, Ms. Jennifer Porter. He's the executive director of the Mayor's Office of Women's Policy Initiative for the District of Columbia. 
and she's going to speak uh, for a few moments on the centennial celebration of the passage of the 19th Amendment, including a reference to passage of the Voting Act of 1965. Uh, evening, everyone. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation to join you all on this special commemorative right. celebration. Today and this year, we commemorate 100 years of action and advocacy taken by a group of women who came together and organized for change, much like the convening that we have here today. And I want to acknowledge uh, all of your national, regional, and local leaders who are here. We know that empowered women empower women. And so I'm so honored to be here with you all and have our Office of Women be a partner in the fight to empower women. So I just wanna acknowledge Liz, Liz, Dorinda, Hazel, Estelle, and all of our regional and national leaders um, who continue to keep your work and to continue to empower women. We know that when women come together and organize, change happens. Women like Ida B. Wells, women like Nanny Helen Burroughs, who fought to make a statement that women who work, women who pay and contribute to society, women who serve their community, deserve and demand equality under the law. The issues those bold women faced over 100 years ago are issues that are just as is important today to us. Issues like equal pay, issues like equity, health equity, and issues like being able to determine our own health outcomes and the ability to meet the needs for our families. We know that after, after its passage, the 19th Amendment did not bring full voting rights to all Americans, and that it wouldn't be until decades later, into the 1960s, for African Americans to have equal access to the ballot box. And if we speak truthfully, about that fact, still today across our nation, multiple forms of voter suppression are alive and well, and the fight to protect voting rights continues. Of course, there's no better example of where the fight for equal voting rights continues than right here in Washington, DC. This time last year, our team was preparing for our historic congressional hearing on HR 51. Today, we're celebrating its passage and the fact that we're closer than we've ever been to statehood for Washington, D.C. This year's centennial gives me hope and it gives us a commitment that we must continue the work of today. The suffragettes may have never dreamed that 100 years later in the future, women will be leading the capital, such as our mayor, serving as Speaker of the House of Representatives, and being up as the first woman, uh, I'm sorry, being lined up as the first woman to run and potentially lead our, our, our nation, excuse me. We now know that what they imagined would not be difficult, but we know that they would still be dedicated and determined women who would still be fighting to improve our communities. So today we have the opportunity to continue their legacy, to continue their impact, the community. We know that we must register and continue to vote and encourage everyone to vote. We know that we have the opportunity and the responsibility to fill out the census this year, making sure that we're resourcing our communities with everything that our tax dollars are paying for. We know that we must prioritize our mental health. So I ask you on behalf of our mayor, to continue to join us in the fight. And we know that you all have done this for many years. So I thank each of you, I celebrate with you all, and I continue to join you in the work. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you, Je thank you, Jennifer. I had to clap, um, <laughs> but, but thank you so much for joining us. Um, now I'd like to acknowledge the presidents of the clubs, which are um, Estelle Lloyd, who is president of the Metropolitan Women's Democratic Club, Estelle. Hello, Estelle, I know she's on here somewhere. And uh, Jeanette Mobley, who is the president of the DC Democratic Women's Club. Jeanette, okay, she's not saying a word. And I'd like to thank 
uh, Liz Duarte, who is actually our Eastern Regional Director for the National Federation of Democratic Women. And she is the one who's hosting us tonight and doing all the managing of our Zoom call for this evening. So thank you, Liz, for once again being our wonderful host. And we look forward to working with you again in the future. You're a wonderful regional director. With that said, um, I'd like to move on to our illustrious guest tonight, um, Miss Brenda Jones. Brenda and I um, met years ago on Capitol Hill. She was working for John Lewis, and I was working for Congresswoman Diane Watson from Los Angeles. And Brenda and I, being fellow Virgos, we met <laughs> and we hit it off. Am I correct, Brenda? Absolutely. And we, we hit it off as Virgos, and we are very unique people. Um, and we basically kept in contact over the years. And as you know, um, she was the communications director to Congressman um, John Lewis. And in her role, she was also known as the wordsmith and whisperer to Congressman Lewis. She wrote a book together with him. And she is also recently the author of a series of books called The Queens, uh, Queens of the Resistance, which feature um, feature um, uh, there's about Nancy Pelosi, Maxine Waters, Alexandria, Os, 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 I forgot how to say it. Cortez. Cortez. And then um, Elizabeth Warren. And so Democratic her, women, in other words, right? Democratic women who are queen <laughs> of the resistance. And it's right on point that we should speak about them because as Jennifer said when she spoke early about women coming together and the 19th Amendment, the, the right to vote, these women are the epitome of women who have paved the way and continue to mentor and pave the way for women today. So without further ado, I'm so excited, Brenda, um, I'd like to present to everyone Miss Brenda Jones, uh, and Brenda, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Dorinda, for having me here with you. I think um, I'm very impressed by the Democratic women because they elected someone like Dorinda White, who is such a, a committed, smart, intelligent, and capable leader, uh, and definitely involved and engaged in democratic politics. So it's really my pleasure to be here. And this feels like the absolute right audience to be talking about this book. I wore my Good Trouble t-shirt with John Lewis's signature on it. You probably can't see it. But, stand up. Um, see it. Stand up. Well, I don't want to stand you? up. I can kind of show you a little bit. Can you see it? Oh, see? yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, so I am in sync with you all. What I want to say is one of the key reasons that we wrote this book, I have a collaborator who wrote uh, the book with me, uh, Krishan Trotman, is because women like Nancy Pelosi, um, dare I say Hillary Clinton, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Elizabeth Warren, Maxine Waters, are all incredible women who, regardless of politics, we should be celebrating. These women are seminal leaders who um, have made history. And I think we were a bit dismayed and concerned after the um, debacle associated with Hillary Clinton's campaign. And, and the real vilification, which, which really seemed... Um, almost absurd. You know, it's one thing to um, have problems with someone's politics or questions about it. It's another thing to vilify and, and a, a, an opponent and, and por uh, portray them in really monstrous terms. I mean, the things that I heard about Hillary Clinton were just completely outsized and seemed to have nothing to do with who she was or even politics at all. So I think we felt we needed to write something that was unabashedly celebratory about the leadership of these incredible women and allow young people and people who are engaged in the political process to learn more about them as women to uh, hear about how they got their start, to um, help women see that these great leaders that you see on television and 
you know, advocating um, on issues that you think are so important started just like you and me. You know, some of them were the products of single mothers. Some of them were, uh, you know, had death in their family. Some of them were started out very poor. Some of them had advantages and political opportunities. Some of them were oppressed by their husbands you know, experienced divorce, had children, all of the things that you hear women feel dismay about or feel as though um, are impediments to their career, these women not only experience them, they sometimes they use those experiences as a platform for their, um, their elevation, or sometimes they overcame what, um, they experienced. So we wanted people to know that these are great women. These are women who have overcome things and have done, made historic strides. And we should have no um, reason to look at them in any other way except as leaders who have succeeded. Now, you can have different political viewpoints, but um, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be unwilling to give these women the respect they're due. And that's what these books are about. So I wanted to read the introduction, if you would allow me, to um, the book. It takes only about, you know, it's only like two pages and it only take me about three minutes to read. But I think it really sets up why we did this and why we feel like it's important for all women, young, old, and men, to comprehend who these women are. So it starts out, um, Dear Sis, The Queens of the Resistance is a series that celebrates the, lives and, the life and times, as well as the lessons and rise, of our favorite sheroes and queen bees of politics. It's a celebration of the boss, the loud in their demands, and a rebellion against the long and tired patriarchy. They are the shining light and the new face of the U.S. government. The idea for the series began to germinate in 2016. Hillary Clinton was in the presidential race. She was top dog, grade A. She was supposed to go all the way as the first female president. She had done everything right. In the 1960s, she switched parties when the civil rights movement was demonstrating that changing allegiance wasn't about betting on the winner, but believing in a different vision for America's future. She married one of the most capable politicians of the 20th century, Bill Clinton, who would eventually appoint the first black sec secretaries of commerce and labor and put women and minorities in many positions of power. She was considered most likely to be president when she gave a commencement speech during her graduation from Wellesley, then went on to graduate Yale Law at the head of her class. She was the first female partner of two law firms in Arkansas, first lady of Arkansas, first lady of the United States. But she didn't stop there. She became the first female U.S. Senator from New York and one of the first female Secretaries of State. She was the first woman ever to be nominated by a major political party to run for president. Even the political machine was oiled and greased to work in her favor. She had been generally considered one of the most qualified people ever to run for president, even by her opponents. But with all that going for her, somehow, some way, she didn't make it. Sigh. You can't get more presidential than Hillary Clinton in 2016. She had it all, even the majority of popular votes in the 2016 election. So what happened? Ha! Every woman knows what happened. Everybody laughed at her in 1995 when she appeared on the Today Show and attributed the chop down of her husband to a vast right-wing conspiracy. But she was right. Who knew that while we were enjoying the moment, the wind beneath our wings for two terms with the first black president, a time that had left us proximal to a variety of enjoyable mini multicultures, 
like sushi, guacamole, breakdancing, there was a group of malcontents intent on making America great again, great like the 1940s. And that meant forcing women back into the kitchen, padlocking the door and throwing away the key. There'd be no need to vilify female candidates with memes, negative ads, and sucker punches like the opposition had to do to Hillary Clinton. The social stigma would do all the policing and policy work needed to keep women out of the ring and out of the way. So the boys could rule unchecked, unaccountable, and unrestrained. Less for me, I'm, I'm sorry, less for you, more for me. That has been a natural law in a capitalist society. It means getting rid of competition by every means necessary. Deportation, mass incarceration, legislation, deprivation, deconstruction, and divestment, to name a few. Our sister, our sister Hillary was a woman who fell in the crosshairs of a right-wing machine, dead set against any diversion from its outrageous plan. To stop collective action and make sure politics bends only to its will and not the people's. It didn't matter that Hillary, Hillary was the smartest, the most prepared, or the first this or that. Merit's not the point. It's compliance that matters. And Hillary was just too damn smart, too capable, too talented for her own good. She had a vast right-wing conspiracy working against her, and they won, temporarily. And that's where this series begins. Queens of the Resistance is as much an ode to the women themselves as it is a celebration of a transcending political identity in America, unlike anything our history has ever shown us before. With love, Brenda and Krishan, Queens of the Resistance. And I was reading from the Nancy Pelosi um, biography. And, and what it is, is mainly just short biographies of these women that are accessible, approachable, meant to attract people who would never pick up a 300 page biography of any of these women, but who need to know who they are and need to garner respect for their accomplishments. So with that, I'm open to more conversation. I'd like to say something, just a comment. That was amazing. And you are an outstanding storyteller as well. I was just all into that, like, wow. But it's absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for that. That was beautiful. Well, thank you. I really want to thank the Democratic women because it is because of you that I am here. It's because of you that, that women have the right to, to vote. Um, you know, by extension. And it's because of you that we are a power broking part of the democratic process. And so I'm very proud to be here. And I'm really glad that we are standing together, working together, and trying to make a difference in, in our society. It's very, very important. I know that that was one of the key things that Congressman Lewis believed in, that we should do everything possible to make this society be what we want it to be. We can't, we can't afford to stand on the sidelines. And the women who are here are all digging in and trying to make something happen. And it, it is a very proud moment for me to be here with you. Thank you for all you do. Okay, this is uh, Anissa Akbar. Um, I just wanted to pop in really quick. Um, you mentioned like women being able to dig in. Um, and with so many of you all on the line, I did have a question. It could be answered now or later. But um, for a lot of us young women, um, 35, but those who work in arenas that um, uh, tend to silence 
uh, women. So I'm in, in the Marine Corps uh, and work at the Center for Disease Control. Um, how would you all um, guide or mentor um, us in terms of digging in and making the change needed uh, in those leadership positions uh, at, at those types of institutions, whether that be military or uh, other federal agencies, over. Well, I can start answering that question, but Dorinda, you may have some thoughts as well, or Hazel. Um, in my mind, when people are silenced and marginalized, it is very important to co-align. So to find community uh, of people uh, within the organization or outside of it, because what you d you discover even on Capitol Hill, that when you want to make a significant difference, there has to be public will. So uh, one member of Congress, even a powerful member of Congress like John Lewis, uh, had a certain amount of leverage, and certainly Con Congressman Lewis, as I think you discovered. Um, through his funeral, for one thing, um, had a tremendous amount of influence. But it's really the people of this country that make a significant difference. And so it makes it so much easier for people who want to say no, but are persuaded to say yes. When you have coalition, when you're not fighting by yourself, but you are strategically connected to a group of people who can help you win not every single battle, but all of the battles that count. And so um, if you're in an organization where you feel like you're being silenced, uh, first, I think you have to determine, do you want to stay there? Do you want to fight that battle? Sometimes it's not worth it or you feel like you don't want to be on the bleeding edge of change in, a, in an institution. But if you decide to fight, you have to get very smart, very strategic, and you have to co-align with um, institutions and organizations like this one, perhaps, that can help you pry open opportunity in, in places where people are being unfair. What would you say, Dorinda? Do you have any thoughts about that? Or Hazel? Can you hear me, everybody? Yeah. No, I think you are. Am muted. I muted? N not you, but I think a Dorinda might be. Dorinda's muted. Go ahead, Hazel. Okay, thank you. I would suggest that what you said is absolutely on point. Um, it is important to align yourself with others, and I really think it's important to understand the rules. I used to play tennis, and uh, my instructor would always say, you can't play the game if you don't know the rules. And mm -hmm. so when an important part of knowing the rules is having a mentor, and uh, oftentimes that mentor may not look like you, maybe in a different age bracket, but it's somebody who has experience, but somebody also knows oftentimes where the bones are buried, the politics of the atmosphere in which you work or you're operating, and somebody who can give you pointers. And so while it's important to align yourself with organizations like ours, of course, um, if you can single out some individuals who can provide some leadership and guidance as well. And again, I really wanna emphasize that it doesn't have to do with age because we can all learn from each other and uh but we all have something to bring to the table we all have varied experiences and so to that extent we can learn and i i, I just think it's imperative that in in the marines that's a tough one because you're surrounded by men who in many cases not out not, not broad brush but uh maybe insensitive but there has got to be somebody maybe close maybe far who can serve as a mentor to help you through some difficult challenges Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, thank you, Hazel. I'm actually go going to go on to the next because we're we're trying to stay on our timeline here. But I'm going to go on and ask um, Doxy McCoy. Uh, Doxy, 
you have a question to pose? Hi, Doxy. I remember yeah, Doxy McCoy from the Hill, from the Hill, Hill too, right? <laughs> right. right. <I'm> directors. <laughs> yes, uh, I was just curious, and thank you for your, your books, and thank you for all that you have done, or your good trouble. I was curious as to, and someone in the chat room put the same question, how did you select the uh, women that you selected for uh, the books? Well, these women are icons. I think they are, um, they are unarguably leaders in our society. And so um, I think that's what we were looking for. People who other women look up to in a, um, in a way that, uh, you know, uh, is without question. There's no, um, there's no question that the first female speaker of the house um, twice is an incomparable leader in our society or the first chairwoman of the financial services committee and the first African-American chair of the financial services committee is an, an unadulterated accomplishment. Uh, Senator Warren uh, is an individual who what, didn't even work on Capitol Hill and created a branch of government that exists to this day. Um, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez certainly represents the new wave of leadership that is headed to Capitol Hill, and I think is going to become a very distinguished um, congressional leader. So I think we chose them. We wanted it to be diverse, but we wanted it to be um, pure success that we celebrated. And so that's how we chose those women. Definitely I'll, understood. Okay, uh, Luana. Luana Kayandoli. Yes, um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I was uh, raising my hand for the prior question. And I just wanted to add um, to what the Hazel Tom Thomas said. I'm ex-Marine and uh, I mean ex-Army mm -hmm. and uh, 47 years of government service. Um, the, one of the things that I think is really important is when they give you that uh, employee handbook and the rules and regulations for the agency or the group that you're in, uh, read it backwards and forwards and sideways and every way and know what's in it and use it to your um, uh, uh, your advantage in, in everything that you do in terms of uh, negotiating uh, the, the obstacles that may be in your way. That's all. Thank, thank you. Uh, hold on. Thank you, Luana. I, we also have a question from Bernadette Vaduro. Hi, thank you everyone. I'm from New Mexico and I'm glad to be here. Wow, wow, that reading was incredible. My question is that we have people like Trump that uh, take over the conversation. Every one of the women that you've talked about and so many women have been called nasty women and then yes. it sticks and you know we're all proud nasty women right now right <laughs> <laughs> but um i'm really worried about the gaslighting that is going on you know uh, the the way that they are able to shift the conversation and i really feel like what would you recommend to create an echo chamber that is united i know united with biden but we've got to do something else i am really worry. There are a lot of people that just drink the Kool-Aid. Do you have any ideas, strategies, suggestions of how we can better pull our resources together to create an, e an echo chamber that will defeat Donald Trump, that will pull, you know, pull the wool out? Well, we can win. Um, uh, my what I think we do is give too much power to people like Donald Trump and the idea that the media and all these things outside of ourselves govern who we are. How did Donald Trump get elected? We put him there. You know, if we had been a society that rejected out of hand 
the um, kind of politics that he represents, and there are many places where he could not gain any traction. I think what we've got to ask ourselves as Americans is why an individual like Donald Trump could captivate American thinking enough for us to empower him. We gave him the power to do what he is doing now. And what we need to do is begin putting our power behind individuals who represent what we represent or what we want this country to be. And, uh, and we have to go at that like our lives depend on it. You know, we can't sit back. I think what has happened for a long time in American politics is that people have allowed, relegated it to other folks. They think, well, you know, everything is going to basically be okay. You know, I'm going to be able to buy my house and my kids to school, et cetera, et cetera. And they feel like it doesn't make any difference who's in the White House. Uh, uh, most Americans who are eligible don't vote. And so now we have a circumstance where our sort of lackadaisical approach, uh, not to be uh, hypercritical, but our, our willingness to allow other people to be engaged while we disengage, it has worked against us. And I think there is no, the, the people of this country are unstoppable. And that's why all of us who work on Capitol Hill know so much is invested in disempowering people because we really hold the reins. It's not all these other entities. It's not the media. You know, if we decided to watch some other stuff, the media would produce whatever it was that we were watching. They really would. Or if we decided to elect another individual aside from somebody like Donald Trump, he would be in, he or she would be in office. And I think, um, I think more than anything, what the problem has been is our willingness, our divestment in the process. We need to be more invested so that all these machinations are nullified. If everybody who was able to vote voted in this country, there would be no way to shave off a little edge that gave somebody an advantage. The fewer people who vote, and the fewer people who are engaged, it leaves more room for all those interests that want to control what's happened here. But if we engage at a maximum level, we could, we could call all the shots. Uh, Brenda, Dorinda, again, a uh, quick question. What do you think your, uh, your, the late uh, Congressman John Lewis would say about the nomination and acceptance of a nomination of Kamala Harris as our vice president? Uh, vice presidential nominee for the Democratic Party. What do you think he would say if you were writing his speech right now? <laughs> you know, as a speechwriter, we know what it is being a mm -hmm. speechwriter. But if you were writing the speech for him and you wanted to coin a certain, I don't know, a phrase or something to say how he felt uh, about this nomination, what would what do you think he would say? What would well, you have to say? and 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 thank you for that because I certainly did write his speeches that he gave at the Democratic. National Convention uh, in 2008 and, um, you know, 2012 and 2016. So uh, I think he would be very proud of the nomination of Kamala Harris. Uh, Kamala Harris did come to his office and sit down with him before she decided to, to get in the race for president. And he was supportive of her candidacy. He didn't uh, endorse anyone uh, who was running because I think he felt he knew so many of the candidates and was proud of many of them. He didn't want to um, weigh in in that regard, but would certainly have been supportive of anyone who became the Democratic nominee. So I think he would, would celebrate it. I think he would be very proud of the fact that the Democratic Party has empowered women to take a leadership role. And we would be talking about that in the, in, in a, if, he were, if we were writing a speech now, we'd be talking about the 19th Amendment 
we'd be talking about the leadership of women. We'd be talking about how, how long it has taken. Women have long deserved this opportunity because even, he would say, even in the civil rights movement, they were the backbone of all of the efforts that occurred in the movement. And in many, many instances, women were the ones behind the scenes who were visionary. You know, I think people are willing to say we did the work, um, but we were also visionaries who came up with ideas that were meaningful and powerful that others acted on, or sometimes we acted on, like SNCC for example, when the young people met at Shaw University to, de to develop a sort of um, youth branch of the civil rights movement, Ella Baker, who was an older woman, you know, uh, I, I'm, I agree with Hazel, this whole idea that, that multi-generational uh, movements are not a reality is, is, is just not historically accurate. The civil rights movement was certainly a multi-generational movement. And in this instance, an older woman who'd been involved in civil rights struggle, but who was passionate, ultra progressive and visionary, who wanted to be a part of a youth con uh, convention or convening of young people to determine how they should be involved in the civil rights struggle, was there, a woman named Ella Baker. And they were convening to form a sort of youth branch of the SCLC. And she said to them, no, don't do that. Do, you know, be your own leaders, be your own voice. And they, they followed her leadership and guidance. And that's one of the reasons that SNCC became a separate organization. So I think he would be celebrating the vision of the Democratic Party to put a woman in a leadership, in a historic leadership role. Absolutely. I'm mute. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brenda. Uh, now I'm going to introduce the panel of DC Federation of Democratic Women members who are part of our DC Federation of Democratic Women's Team 2020. And uh, that's Ms. Hazel Thomas, you've heard from her already. She's our past president of the DC Federation of Democratic Women. Doxy McCoy, who was from the DC Women's Democratic Club. And Cosette Thomas, who was from the Metropolitan Women's Democratic Club. And as I said earlier, we have both presidents, um, Jeanette Mobley from the DC Democratic Women's Club and Estelle Lloyd from the Metropolitan Women's De Democratic Club on the line also that are under the DC Federation of Democratic Women. With that, I'd like to ask Cosette. Uh, uh, oh, I know you're from New Mexico. I, I saw you, uh, Bernadette. Um, I'd like to ask Cosette Thomas. Um, you have a question prepared for Brenda. Cosette? Okay, she might not be muted. Okay, we're going to go to Hazel. Hazel Thomas? Well, since Cosette is not on the line, and you know I am a Gen X or a Gen Z or something of this sort, <laughs> I just want to know, um, can you help me figure out, you know, you said your book was very readable, uh, yeah. whereas many people won't read 300 pages. They might read your book because it's a, you know, a very a simple sort of abbreviated version of the life and history of these famous women. Um, so since I'm, a, I think I'm a Gen, Gen, a Gen Zer, so can you help me? How do I become uh, a queen of the resistance? How do I get in good trouble? You got any ideas? Oh. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. And so what I want to do is maybe use some of the examples of women in these books okay. to describe that. Because, because we haven't talked about their stories and what makes mm -hmm. them powerful. So one way I think that would be interesting and uh, original in terms of getting in good trouble is, is loving yourself, your story, and using who you are as a platform for greatness. Okay. The person that I think exemplifies that more than any other is Nancy Pelosi. 
She is a woman who was born into politics. So um, let us be clear. She, she did have politics in her veins, but she was the girl in the family. She had, um, I think it's five brothers and her father was a member of Congress as well as the mayor of Baltimore. And her mother though, is the person that she credits as having taught her politics because her mother ran their household like a district office. <laughs> Every morning the, um, at about 10 o'clock, the doors of that house would open and people would come in one by one and talk to the mother and the children were all taught how to do various things. They could pick up the phone and call certain agencies of government to connect people with um, answers to their problems. They could, you know, take down, you know, notes and, and count votes and do all kinds of things that would be done really mm -hmm. today in a district kind of setting. And Nancy mm -hmm. Pelosi used that, that grounding as a platform to build a powerful career in politics. She had, she had all her children first. She never ever felt like her kids were an impediment to her career. Mm -hmm. She loves children. She <laughs> embraced having children. And, um, and sometimes people, there's stories of her bringing her children to meet some famous people, but she used her cooking in the, um, kitchen, for example, as an opportunity to bring politicians home, meet them, feed them, come to know them in a personal setting. And this helped her develop relationships. Then she got into fundraising, never at any time thinking that she was really going to run for public office, but she did what she could because she was engaged by the political process she did what she knew and she used her home and her family as a platform for growth. And now Nancy Pelosi, when you really think about it, has it all. She mm -hmm. has a, a family. She's been married a long time. She uh, has successful children and she has an incredible career. So one of the things I think that's important in terms of getting into good trouble is believing in who you are, not... Mm -hmm. um, not putting yourself down or thinking that because of where you started um, that there are any impediments, but look at everything as a road to opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> she also has a husband who selects beautiful clothes for her. Yes, she, ha <laughs> she has a, she has a, you know, wonderful relationship. And this is, I mean, I don't know whether we think of Nancy Pelosi as a woman who has it all, but she really does. Well, and that's that, one reason why we rewrote these so we could get people viewing these women in a different kind of context. Okay, I'd like to take a pause. Thank you, Brenda. I'd like to take a pause to welcome Carolyn Kennedy from the Washington DC. She's the executive director of the Brotherhood and Sisterhood International. Welcome, Carolyn Kennedy from the uh, well, I just said her name, uh, Bernadette Maduro from New Mexico. Um, we have quite a few uh, women from around the country who've joined us and very happy to have you. Um, Doxy McCoy, you had another question. Thanks, Dorinda. Uh I was just curious, Brenda, about um, the timing. Uh, well, kind of a double question. How long did it take you to write it? And also, did you, was it a, just a coincidence that it, uh, it, happening during the uh, centennial of the uh, 19th Amendment, or did you plan it that way? We didn't plan it as it relates to the 19th Amendment, but we did plan it to be part of the political conversation for this election. So we wanted it to be ready um, by the time of the Democratic National Convention. And um, because we knew these women would be on display and we wanted to be able to talk about them in a positive, an unabashedly positive way to begin to change the conversation as the lady was talking about, to, to begin to shift the echo chamber to something 
that should that sh that is more true actually that these women should be celebrated uh for their capacity and their leadership and so um we did time it to come out in time for the convention and of course we were aware of the um coinc coincidence with um the 19th amendment anniversary thank you mm -hmm. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Hazel, because Cosette, I don't think, is on the line. Oh, I'm sorry. I see Janice Davis, our former National uh, Federation of Democratic Women. Uh, Hayes, uh, Janet, Janice, can you please unmute yourself? Hi. Hello. Welcome. Janice Hi, is thanks. our former National Federation of Democratic Women president on the National. I have one quick question for her. Yes. You know, sometimes having worked with women, why are women so very hard? on other women. Um, having run work. campaigns for women, sometimes I, I hear some of our most vocal credits. I'm hearing it again when I hear about Kamala. We are not kind to one another. Oh, what can yes, we do so right. mm. to, I mean, and you know, it, it's bad enough being kicked by some of these guys, but um, I just want us to, to learn how to support one another because it is, as you said, you need a supportive group around you. Well, it, it, is, it is really quite interesting. I think that women are conditioned just like other people are um, to see each other as, um, you know, uh, as diminutive, n not as leaders, not as vision, and I think not as visionaries. And I think we relegate ourselves to certain positions. We sometimes are willing to allow others to take credit, to take, um, uh, for us to take the back seat. And I think it is years, centuries, really, of conditioning that makes us believe this is where we belong. And I think that is one reason why when other women step forward outside of those roles who say, you know, um, I can be vice president of the United States. Mm -hmm. I can be a senator. I can be an astronaut. Women uh, mm -hmm. pull, pull back or want to pull those women back because they feel as though they've stepped out of a box. They're out of line. They're out of a uh, step with the conditioning that many of us have been uh, taught. And uh, we believe ourselves to be uh, smaller than we really are. And I think that's one reason why we wrote these books, because we want people not to see a woman leader in this complicated way that, you know, she has two sides. She's capable, but then she's also sort of a witch, you know. <laughs> but to say, these, these women are human beings, but they are incomparable leaders. And why can't we celebrate them without any reservation? Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of accomplishment of somebody who had become a seminal speaker of the house like Nancy Pelosi, um, they would be shouting from the rafters about someone like that. Instead, mm -hmm. what we have is this very complex, uh, measured, view of who she is that goes up and down depending upon uh, uh you know how we feel on a particular day and i think even she sometimes feels constrained by some of these stereotypes you you will note that she is very collected when she speaks i'm i'm sure in part because she recognizes that if she were to get out of character or maybe even say some of the things that she might feel that people that is backfires you know but donald trump can be you know an obtuse absurd individual and somehow he isn't um he isn't vilified for that he might be criticized but he's not vilified um whereas women who are capable and that's the thing that really disturbed me about what happened to hillary clinton yeah regardless of her politics, I think it was her capability that made people vilify her in, and make her into some kind of monster, which um, 
is inaccurate. It's untrue and it's undeserved. So I think that's, I think we are, we participate in this conditioning and in, in this sidelining and we accept it. And that's not to say that we, sh that there are times, you know, we don't want to become, uh, you know, we shouldn't always be out front, uh, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, criticize other women who are willing to take center stage. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for asking the question, Janice and Brenda for answering it. And Brenda, while you, while you were speaking, someone said, um, where can we purchase your t-shirts? <laughs> ah, well, this t-shirt is very, is, is a, you mean this John Lewis t-shirt? Yes. The yes. very special t-shirt that only his staff have. So I'm sorry about that. You okay. can't purchase it anywhere. Okay. Okay. Um, um, Hazel, on you. I'd like to know where can we purchase your books? Yes. Well, you can purchase my book, any, well, book or books, anywhere books are sold. Um, so Barnes and Noble, indep your favorite independent bookstore, Politics and Prose, um, or Amazon.com. I would encourage you to go to an independent bookstore or to Barnes and Noble, if you can, because many of them are going out of business due to COVID-19. Even Barnes and Noble, people are concerned in the publishing industry that it may not survive. So um, think about that. I know Amazon is, is very convenient, but uh, Barnes and Noble can send you books in the mail too. So can politics and prose. So consider using your... Um, your local bookstore or a chain like Barnes and Noble. I also know that you, um, because because of COVID nineteen, we're not able to be together in person, and so you have very graciously agreed to sign book cards that can be adhered to the front for those people who choose to, uh, who would like to have, well, a copy that's personalized, and I think that's very kind of you. So I wanted to encourage all those people out there in our listening audience to purchase a book and to let us know. You can let me know uh, that you have a book that you like to have personalized, and we will certainly make sure that we follow up and make that happen. That's right. So of we thank you, Brenda, for that. You're more than welcome. Um, it's, it's my pleasure and simple to do to have a book plate um, that you can put inside your book and um, it personalizes it for your library. Let me also mention, um, I, I talked about Nancy Pelosi. I want to mention some of these other women and their fabulous stories, like uh, Maxine Waters, for example. I like this. Maxine Waters is a woman who was raised by an incredible single mother. Um, who uh, was in St. Louis, Missouri. She's from St. Louis, uh, but she's from, um, you know, Missouri, and who was in Missouri at a time when there was an incredible African-American community there. So people um, like Miles Davis, for example, was, was born in that environment. His father was a dentist, and there was this huge... Uh, group of African-American professionals undergirded by a, a network of churches. Mm -hmm. And so this is where she gained this sort of cultural depth, where she recognizes the power and capacity of her own community and is, and is unafraid to assert its capability and competence because she saw that at work. In, um, the teachers who taught her and other professionals who, who were around her. And she was raised by a single mother whose, whose husbands left her. And she had, I think it was 13 children. And, um, but her mother taught her how to be, to speak up for herself and to um, advocate for what she wanted and needed. And, Ultimately, she got married. She moved to California, and that's where her political career began when she learned about Head Start, 
because she was very interested at one point in her life in being a social worker. Either she wanted to be a, a social worker or a dancer because she was um, really impressed by um, a dancer. I, I think it's, is it Dorothy Dunham? I can't remember her. No, that's her name. Yeah, Dorothy name. Dunham, mm -hmm. who was an international um, public figure at the time. Very, very impressive. So she either wanted to be somebody like Dorothy Dunham or she was Catherine very Dunham. impressed by the social worker who came to her house, who she saw as an individual who was a change agent, who could make a difference in her life. And so she decided she either wanted to be a social worker or a dancer. And when she learned about Head Start after having moved to California, she was really excited about it because she thought this this could be my way that I can help communities and people. And she began in that way, eventually became um, a, uh, a deputy to a um, member of the city council. And, um, and then the rest is history. You know, she began winning uh, races and uh, became representative from California. Now she is chairman of the Financial Services Committee. And I think people do not, they don't say that about Maxine Waters, which is to me amazing. She is the top regulatory figure in, on Capitol Hill on the House side who regulates the financial services industry. So that is the banks, the investment houses, and um, all of those kind of financial um, services organizations who are power brokers in our society. Maxine Waters is the one who's holding them accountable. And she went into financial services. She's been on the financial services committee almost since she started on Capitol Hill because she felt that learning about money, who controlled it and how to regulate it could serve her community. So, okay. Yes. Thank you, Brenda. That was fantastic. Yeah. That is. <laughs> Waters really is, is making a difference. I wanted to introduce uh, everyone to Wendy Carson Smith. She's the fifth vice president of the National Federation of Democratic Women. Wendy, unmute yourself. I'm unmuting myself. Good evening, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> This has been such a delightful program. I just wanted to thank, thank Ms. Jones on behalf of the National Federation of Democratic Women for joining us. And I also want to congratulate Dor Dorinda and Liz for this wonderful partnership, allowing them to get everyone together for this much needed discussion. I am just, I am so enthralled with the books and I'm going to put in my order for my granddaughters. That's but, wonderful. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so very much for joining us. And uh, we hope you will come back to us again, maybe after the election so we can celebrate together. Sounds good. Sounds and, very and good. have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, Wendy, for, for those kind words. And now we're going to have a question from Elizabeth Mitchell of the Metropolitan Women's Democratic Club. Elizabeth? Hello, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is incredible. I have to say, I learned about Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth through books just like this when I was growing up in D.C. because they were front and center in the library. And I, they told such easy stories for me to, like, to really understand. And that is so important. So my question to you is, how can we get these books into the front of every library, especially in DC, but in other places too? How can we get these books into the hands of children who need to hear these stories of empowerment, to need to, who need to see the path, need to see the path to power? Because even though we have a record number of women running for US Congress, record number of women of color running for US Congress, we are outnumbered, we are only 29% of the women in state legislatures. We only have 29% mm. of that representation. So excited that Nikina Williams is taking over for John Lewis-ish, hopefully, you know, she's got that seat. But how do we get these books into the hands of girls and young children so they understand that these are powerful stories that we need to hear? Well, I think 
if if each of us were to talk to the libraries and librarians in our communities and say, you know what, I think these are some important books that that maybe you should order so that young people can can have them available. Um, whatever youth groups you're associated with, if you can order the books and um, show them to young people, you know, I'd be happy to come and talk to uh, any groups that you think uh, would be meaningful or be interested in hearing the stories of these women. Um, you know, I just think we just have to talk about it and ask people to uh, order it. <laughs> we're going to order it. We're going to donate it. We're going to take it everywhere. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you mostly because these women are worth it. Their stories are so powerful and they need to be told. Young people should not be seeing these women and, and um, having questions or uncertainty about who they are and what they contribute. You know, they put... Um, they sacrifice a great deal to give us uh, what they give us to contribute to our society and we should respect them for that. Uh, Brenda, thank you for that, um, for that answer. And I'd like to welcome to the conversation, Dr. Gloria Walton from Cheney University uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Walton. And regarding the books, um, I agree 100% that we ought to all reach out to our libraries and to the American Library Association and tell them that we want these books to be amongst a selection that people can either order and, uh, you know, can order or go into the libraries. Well, not going to libraries now, but that they can have access to. But I think these are, uh, do you plan to write any more books on other women? We could. We do think there are some, some other queens of the resistance. Um, I think it all depends on you. If you all become excited about these books and energized by them, I think Random House did consider that it wanted to have other stories coming, but, but it, it depends upon you. It's all up to you. The power is in the people's hands. If you decide that this is something you like and you want to have happen, then, and you demonstrate that, then I think they will do that. And we certainly have others in mind. Like I think um, if the woman who is the Democratic nominee becomes the vice president, she might be a queen of the resistance. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. Hazel Thomas, you had a question. Unmute yourself, unmute yourself. Hazel? Well, I was just going to say Elizabeth's question was spot on. And um, you, we have so many influential people here on this call, both in, you know, in Washington and across the country. We must have some people who are on library boards who can pick up the phone and say, listen, this is a great book series. You really need to have it. And I think that this is one of those times when we have to align ourselves with others and to make our voices known. Uh, because I do think that particularly uh, young, young adults need to know because we're so busy and we're constantly involved and we're on, um, we're in chat rooms and we're doing, uh, uh, we're, we're just so busy that mm -hmm. it, I think it's important for young people particularly to, uh, to actually understand a little bit about history because it can be the impetus to push them into doing something themselves and to, so they can make their own bright future. I, I think that, that uh, we should use our influence wherever we can. Um, and I, one final, just a footnote with regards to using our influence. Um, I, I think that the books, and I only got the one so far, but um, the books are really very inspiring. And mm. we were talking about getting in good trouble and there's so much that we can do both individually and collectively. And so looking at what others have done, oftentimes with little means, uh, right. it's an inspiration. And so for that reason alone, I think the book series is just awesome. So thank you, Dorinda. No, no, no problem. Um, Brenda, how would you suggest that any of our participants tonight uh, get in contact with 
whom if they wanted to get books to either purchase for themselves, um, I know online, but if they wanted to libraries, what would you suggest is the best pipeline to do this? Um, you mean to get in touch with me or to get in touch with the publishing house, yeah. publishing house or? Well, yeah, yeah, probably the publishing house to get a large quantity for a library so they could already have that, the num what it would cost and what to do to actually take to the library so they can make it happen. What I would need to do is get that information to you. Could they get in contact with you and then, or your yeah. organization, Democratic Women? Yeah. And then I could yeah. get the right contact from Random House to connect with you. I don't think it would be difficult, but I don't want to give out inaccurate information. I understand. Got that. Got that. Okay. Um, Boxy McCoy. Um, thanks again, Dorinda. I'm, I'm going to ask a question that um, Sansa Ray Tate Montgomery put in the chat room. And I think, Brenda, you probably know Sansa Ray. Yes, I do. Uh, uh, she wanted to know, uh, wanted you to describe your publishing process. Well, let's see. Um, to make a long story short, I will say I met Krishan Trotman, who is my collaborating author on this, um, through the book that I wrote with Congressman Lewis called Across That Bridge. That is, that is published by now by Hachette. Um, originally, it was published by another publishing house, but Hachette purchased that publishing house, and so it became part of their... Um, their group of books that they publish. So on the paperback version of that book, Across That Bridge, I met Krishan. I liked her. She's an editor in, um, you know, one of the few African-American editors in the publishing world. And so we hit it off and um, we would talk about different projects along the way. And sometimes they would come to fruition. Most of the time they didn't. And so this particular project, she called me on the phone and said, Brenda, I've got something I, I want you to work on with me, but she doesn't really know that much about politics. So she was like, hey, I can't do it by myself. I've got to do it with you. So we started writing the proposal and I didn't, I thought it was going to be like all the other projects that we'd worked on that were promising, but didn't, you know, didn't get bought. But we got an agent and we went to some serious publishing houses in New York and Random House bought it. So that's how it happened. Let's talk about um, another woman. I don't know whether you want to talk about uh, Senator Warren or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, either one. Which would you choose? Um, you know who I think is interesting is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who of course is not a Democrat. <laughs> However, what is fascinating about her is that, and I think what young people learn about her story in particular, that many of you already know, um, she's prepared. She is someone who reads. She um, it researches and she is deeply prepared for whatever it is that she is intent on doing. So when she was a young person in high school, she went to uh, an, uh, an, an integrated high school. I think she was one of the few Latino students there. And she was able to become part of a scientific exhibition for young students. It was an international exhibition. And she had done this incredible biological study um, without getting too technical. Essentially, she had discovered this protein that um, could have been helpful in healing uh, diseases in, in damaged tissue. And um, she only did this study, though, with a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, a worm. But it did show this, you know, great biological promise. And so 
she actually won second place in this international competition of scientists and um, got a star named after her when she was in high school. So one of the things, one of the things that I was thinking when I was writing these books was, let me write some books so people can feel that, you know, these are women just like them who became these celebrated figures of politics. And what I realized is, actually, no, they are all really quite extraordinary women um, and all had significant accomplishments. Nonetheless, what they do is accessible. And one thing that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez does, she prepares, she studies, mm -hmm. she researches, and she knows what she's talking about. And as we know, um, those of us who work on Capitol Hill, you cannot walk in the room and decide you're going to command anything if you don't know the facts and haven't done your homework. So that's one lesson her story teaches. That is so true. Um, Brenda, speaking about that uh, conversation, she was one of the, um, she was on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, and she was one of those who drilled the joy. What did you think about the way that she handled that? Thought she was absolutely fabulous. <laughs> and um, one of the things I had to convince my publishers about, because some of them even lived in her district, so they just thought she was the thing. Um, and, and one thing they asked me was, well, do you think that Nancy Pelosi was in any way intimidated by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? And uh, because she sat in Nancy Pelosi's office and this, that, and the other. And I tried to tell them, maybe they, uh, maybe they understand now, but I, I said to them, you know what? Uh, the House of Representatives is the Speaker's house, and I doubt that she was intimidated by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. But she was embraced. There were people who really... Uh, enjoyed her energy and wanted to mentor her. And one of them was Maxine Waters, which is why she's on financial services. And the other was um, the, you know, esteemed Elijah Cummings, who was the chair of the oversight and government reform during uh, when she came on board, you know, the late Elijah Cummings. And, uh, those two individuals decided they wanted to nurture and um, mentor her, that they liked her capability and expertise and wanted to put her in those positions. So they deserve credit as well for giving her a platform to display her, her capability. I'd like to open it up for questions from anyone else on the Line, Estelle Lloyd, president of the Metropolitan Women's Democratic Club. Estelle, um, unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay. Am I good? Yes, you are. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. I want to make a comment uh, kind of back, uh, about what Janice was saying. I think as women, as grandparents, and as mothers, we need to, at a very early age, start exposing our children, especially our girls. Uh, Martin Luther King had a saying once that if you take a child to the back door often enough, that person would always go in the back door. So mm -hmm. we've got to make our young folks feel good about themselves, especially our women. And we start early. Exposure is so important, especially reading. So I think if we take if we don't take anything away from this, and there's a lot to take away from it, it's that we need now to start, oh, I don't want to be spotlighted. We need now to start talking to our children and encouraging them to speak up, to speak up and to act out and to be proud of themselves and who they are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think, uh, and I think all of these women are similar to that in that, except for one, I think, um, well, Senator Warren really struggled with those stereotypes of women. So mm -hmm. she had times where she 
derailed herself. She had gotten an opportunity, even though um, she was from Oklahoma. And um, long story, but her parents, I know there are a lot of young people today who really feel badly about our economy and they feel like, you know, they, they are in this terrible circumstance. But if you take uh, Elizabeth Warren's parents who got married and then shortly after they married, there was the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And then after the Great Depression, they lived through the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. they, weren't, um, they weren't in the center of it. They were sort of on the edge of it, but still, you know, 800,000 tons of dust uh, was blown from the Midwest all the way over to the East Coast, and it just devastated people's farms. So for much of her parents' life together, they really struggled. They struggled incredibly. Um, and so she didn't have a lot of the resources that some of her other friends did, but she was smart. And one of the things, that, one of the ways she sort of distinguished herself in high school was that she could <laughs> debate. And her parents, her mom, was concerned about her going to college and didn't really mm -hmm. want her to necessarily go to college. Um, so she decided, okay, I'm going to have to, you know, tack against the wind here. And she said, I'm going to, there's got to be a college that gives a debating scholarship. And so she did some research. She discovered there were only two in the United States, but one was George Washington University. So she actually got a debating scholarship to come to George Washington University and she was, she loved it. She said, you know, it just opened up all of this understanding and cultural opportunity and going to the theater and so many things that she'd never done. And she actually had money because she had scholarships, you know, so she, her room and board was paid for and she had some spending change. And then this guy came who uh, knew her in high school and proposed to her. And she sort of thought it's what she was supposed to do it was her fulfilling her purpose as a woman. And she left college and got married. And um, so it, it is important for us to demonstrate to young women mm -hmm. and young girls and young boys as well, and young men, that a woman's role can be dynamic. It can be as a leader, it can be as a thinker, a scientist, a discoverer, an explorer. It can be a mother. It can be as a, a housewife and a homemaker. All of those things are critical and powerful, important roles. The problem is when women feel they have to, to relegate themselves to one role as opposed to the other. And that's why I would say, you know, we think, for example, about, um, we think that the, the fight against abortion rights is a, is a religious fight. And for some people, I do think the struggle is religious. But the reason it becomes political is because women represent one of the most powerful forces in American politics. And the person who told me this had a very interesting conversation with a democratic uh, operative from Chicago who was a politico. We're talking about Hillary Clinton and you know some of the same things I was saying. I, I couldn't understand why she was so vilified. And he said to me, Brenda, I can tell you why she was so vilified. Because people know, people who broker power in the United States know that women, if they were ever to gather their resources and decide to vote as a block or act as a block, that they would be the most powerful force in the United States. Mm -hmm. And people don't want that to happen. So they vilify female leadership because they don't want people to get used to, feel comfortable with, or think to themselves, well, gee, you know, why can't we have a woman president? Um, and that's part of why the struggle for abortion is political. Do we think Donald Trump cares about whether people can get abortions or not? Mm -hmm. He's not a religious man at all. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. The reason he cares about that is because once women had the freedom to get out of the house, either to um, decide when they wanted to have children, decide not to have children, or could get away from having to raise them, then it, they became a much more competitive force in the workforce and in the economy. They had more capacity to be leaders. And there are some people who think that should be relegated to, you know, just one group of folks. But, you know, children and social pressure becomes a very constricting element. And so we know in the 40s and 50s, what women did was stay home. And that's what what's one thing that Elizabeth Warren struggled with. She, she had this burning desire to be, um, to be a lawyer. And um, she had children, though. And she was trying to figure out, how, how do I do all of this um, at the same time? So that's one thing I really want to leave you with. The struggle for abortion rights is about political power more than anything else. The, the religion is used as a tool, but the reason it has political engagement is because it, it would help to constrict the ability of women to lead. Thank you, Brenda, for those um, for, for for sharing this with us. And I know um, we we were said we we're going to end at eight thirty. But is there anything you'd like to share as in, in parting that you'd like to share with us women um, from around the country who are inspired by not only your four biographies, both of Senator Warren, uh, the Representative Ocasio Cortez, uh, Maxine Waters, and Nancy Pelosi? I got them all right. Um, is there anything you'd like to 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 leave us with um, that? Uh, is on your mind that you'd like to share with us? The only thing I want to say is that you have the power. Wow. You are the people of this country and you have the power. Why do you think there are forces trying to keep you from voting? Why do you think there are, you know, there is a, an entire network and a series of strategies to try and disengage and disempower you? because no one can stop a committed and determined people who have decided their time has come. And if there is no more urgent time in American history, it is now to really save this country from a, a group of people who don't believe in democracy and don't, who, who are not interested in the um, advancement and progress, democratic progress, that we know this country is destined to, to experience if we, if we invest in it. So I would say, be the dreamers that you, um, you know, dream those dreams and go forward and actualize them, make them happen because you have all the power. It's not the media, it's not the White House, it's not Congress. They can't do anything without you. And don't forget that. Okay, thank you, Brenda. I do have one other question. She, was, she had raised her hand before you started wrapping up and it's from Luana Kiandoli. Unmute, Luana, hold on. Luana, I'm trying to unmute you and it's not happening. Uh, Luana. Okay. I'm, I'm unable to unmute her. Oh, there, there you go. Luana. Yes. Uh, yes. I uh, was uh, just uh, 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 writing a, a question for the chat uh, regarding a contact list for this dynamic group of women. Uh, if um, it's possible uh, to have to share the members uh, who are participating on this program tonight. Um, you can email me. Um, uh, hold on. How do I unmute? Can you hear me? Yeah. And we've got some brothers on the call. Oh, yeah. There's some. We have a lot of men on the call tonight. Oh, wonderful. Yes, we do. We have some men on here. Um, Mr. William Clyburn is on along with Reverend, I forgot where he went, Reverend 
I have to go through all these things here. But yeah, we've had some men on here who have been very yeah, Nelson, Minister Nelson Watkins. Minister Nelson Watkins. Yes. yes. Oh, Eli Grayson. I remember you when I worked in Congressman Watson's office um, with Bert Hammond. How, thank you for joining us uh, with the Freedmen of Oklahoma. Okay. Um, so we've had uh, quite a diverse group here tonight. And I'd like to, Hazel, do you want to say one last thing before really I... Really very quickly, okay. unmute myself. Um... No. Oh, we you can't hear you. Before, so try again. Yeah. Hi, Hazel, we can't hear you. Hazel, unmute yourself. Hazel. Okay, there you go. Okay. <laughs> I can read. I really can. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, it occurred to me that since you said we have the power, one of the things we, 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 are, we, we certainly can be empowered by reading your books and gaining knowledge and inspiration. And then one of the things that we oftentimes don't talk about is that, and I heard this, it's not original to me. But one lady said once, if we would invest in a political campaign, what we would use to buy a nice dress, just one nice dress, mm. that would be awesome. That our collective power, financial power, would make such an impact. So think about that. You know, we, we can't go anywhere. Nobody's going to see all our huge, wonderful, beautiful wardrobes. Invest the amount of one beautiful dress in the campaign of your choice. And of course, I know the one that I have in mind. It's called, uh, the initials are uh, Biden Harris. Uh, <laughs> but if you, I think that would be, that would help to move us along, you know, wonderful. Well. And, and I just wanted to, to just remind, we do have a few announcements. Yeah, I just want to say, and think about what kind of difference that could make, you know, um, adding one more dress to your closet or doing something that could change the entire landscape of this nation. Uh, one donation, $150, or however much you end up spending on the dress, $3,000 some people spend. <laughs> <laughs> that just one, you could, you could make that a slogan, you know, just one dress, sacrifice one dress to make one donation. Absolutely. May I also tell people how they can get in touch with me? Yes, please do. Uh, I do have a website that is Brenda Jones Inc. Inc. Dot com. That's all you have to do is go to that web website, Brenda Jones Inc. Dot com, and you can get in touch with me. I'm writing it in the chat right now www.brenda Jones Inc. Jones Inc. Dot com. It's in the chat. Um, so before we, we bid uh, Brenda adieu and thank her for her graciousness by being with us this evening, we have a few announcements from uh, the DC Federation of Democratic Women uh, by our Vice President of Programs, um, Gwendolyn Johnson. Gwendolyn, unmute yourself. Gwen? Okay. Gwendolyn? Okay, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi, my name is Gwendolyn Johnson, and, and I am the second vice president of D uh, D.C. Federation of Democratic Women, and I keep hearing uh, we want to get in trouble, but it's going to be good trouble, not the trouble that Donald Trump is causing. Uh, I do have some announcements, and of course, I, I, um, I certainly want you all to know what we're doing. The Metropolitan Women Democratic Club has the following upcom upcoming activities. NWDC has been aggressively working to get out the vote in battleground states, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin through text banking, phone banking, and postcarding. Uh, at, at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, September the 9th, MWDC will be hosting an event featuring Michigan State Representative uh, China Koshrun on how to help Michigan get out the vote. They will also hope a representative from the Office of Board of Election to discuss how to vote by mail and in person on November the 3rd. 
on October the 3rd from 9 to 11 p.m., they will be hosting a debate watch party. And the number is, in order to get in contact with them, is 202-297-3381 for information about any of these activities. The D.C. Democratic Women's Club have also been text banking and phone banking. They have tentatively a scheduled youth town hall for September the 15th, 2020. More information is forthcoming. Please contact Melissa Abram at I-R-B-Y-M-E-L-I-S-S-A-16 at hotmail.com. The D.C. Federation... The D.C. Federation of Democratic Women Team 2020 is working with Bob King on an information of outreach programs for senior citizens. Please contact me at area code 202-450-6325. And I would really like for you, you all to contact me about the senior citizens because we're at a very low, low turnout. So, um, these are the things that I would really love for us to be working on. Thank you so very much. Okay, and Brenda, Ray Bridgewater is saying uh, to Brenda and everyone, brilliant presentation. Brenda, I'm proud of you. I know your, uh-oh, it just jumped up. I know your mother would be so proud. Everyone else in the line encourage your libraries to purchase Miss Jones's book. They had the funds to do so. Great program. Just had oh, to wonderful. give you that piece of Thank information. You. Thank you so much, Ray Michael. So, Tonight, we got into some good trouble with uh, Brenda Jones, former uh, communications director to Congressman John Lewis, uh, Wordsmith and Whisperer, and the author, co-author of four wonderful biographies about Queens of the Resistance. And with that, please give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Democratic women. You are the best, the Thank greatest. You for joining Yay. us tonight. And with that, we notice we didn't have any Republican women. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't. You're not right. That, you know, uh, not that uh, we started where uh, we thought the case was the strongest. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And if anyone would like to reach me, I'm the president of the DC Federation. My email address is Dorinda W D O R I N D A W at gmail.com. My phone is 202 491. 3033, and we look forward to inviting you to our future event that we're going to have someone not as good as Brenda, because she's a fellow Virgo. <laughs> she's a fellow Virgo sister. Virgos stick together, but we thoroughly enjoyed your honesty and your forthrightness and your earnestness with sharing you with us tonight. So thank you. And thank you for having me, Dorinda. It's a wonderful opportunity and thank you so much for your leadership as head of this democratic women's organization and thank men you. were inspired tonight too what <laughs> Mr. Clyburn, wonderful Mr. <laughs> amen amen <laughs> and the men were inspired too thank you men for joining yeah. us and with that um we have finished our conversation with yeah. brenda jones so ladies and gentlemen have a good evening and we look Thank forward you. to seeing you again in the near future. And get out there and vote and make it happen. Yeah. And you Amen. Fill out the census. Amen. Thanks, Brenda.